It's no secret. A lot of what we see on the television or internet is false. Mm. But the FTC still tries to keep TV programs and advertisements from lying to viewers in the first place. But sometimes, scams can slip through their fingers or go unnoticed. And then we can get TV deception on a massive scale broadcast to everyone. Unfortunately, these scams can really hurt people. Or they can just be a nuisance that lightens our wallets. Sometimes broadcasts have even gotten hijacked and we've gotten some really creepy novelties. I think it's an interesting subject and worth a look. So let's take a look at the worst of these deceitful exploitations. These are the 10 biggest scams ever broadcast on television. And obviously, this isn't an attack on any particular person. This is just us taking a journey and shedding some light on some good old fashioned BS. With that said, let's begin. And starting with number 10, the 1900 number scams. These 1900 ads were just unbelievable. Most of these 1900 calls were $2 a minute, which would be nearly $5 a minute nowadays. That's very costly when most of the time someone was just telling you a load of bull crap. And some of the junk they came up with was more than outright scams. Some of it was so stupid it was barely comprehensible. Take this service, for example. Cute little dog you've got there. But hold on, in a previous life, he could have been George Washington. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Nice cat. Perhaps Annie Oakley? And look at him, why it's Napoleon. They say over 18 only. But what adult is honestly gonna call this number? Hey, Boo, let's call and find out who my cat Shadow was. Yeah. Look, don't call the number, you two. I'm sure he was the Prince of Wales. It, it's probably not even active anymore. Let me show you. Hello? Have you been a naughty boy? Uh, uh, well, I haven't really been naughty. I think I've been pretty well behaved overall. What would you do to me? Well, you don't have to do anything to me. Uh, you could tell me about yourself. Uh, we, could, we could go to lunch. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> gotcha! This 1900 service was a real issue at the time because a lot of these TV ads were targeted towards kids. Some definitely not, but a lot were. Nowadays, of course, there's more regulations that prohibit these lines from advertising to children. But back in the 90s, kids could rack up big charges to their parents' phones. $900 reduce! All to talk to whatever puppet or crazy person was on the other end. In one Simpsons episode, we even seen Lisa rack up a huge debt on the Corey hotline, which was actually a real number in the 80s that you could call. I don't get the appeal personally, but if there had been a number saying I could call Britney Spears when I was 12, I would have called it. Britney Spears was my crush. But even all that aside, some ads just didn't make sense. Like, can you make sense of this ad here? Girl. Yeah. Girl. Perfect. Now, am I meant to call or are women meant to call? I honestly can't tell. What does girl perfect mean? The advertisement's certainly not going to tell me. Am I going to meet Girl Perfect, or are they going to give me fashion tips on how to look Girl Perfect? I honestly can't tell. Long before online dating, they even had 1900 ads for singles. If these were also an expensive scam, is honestly hard to tell. Did these phone ads really bring men and women together for dates? Personally, I've never met a couple who met through these 1900 single services, but maybe they're out there. But what was the very first 1900 number in 1977? Why that was the Ask President Carter program. That's correct, the very first one of these numbers puts you on the phone to the 39th President of the United States. You know, in case you had any questions for him. And honestly, respects for doing that, sir. How did a number where you literally talk to the President turn into such a scamming, fraudulent waste of cash? I don't know. Man, what do we got for number nine? The Who Wants to Be a Millionaire <clears throat> coughing cheat. And just a reminder, this isn't an attack on any individual or person. Many years have passed since this, and I wish the best of health to anyone involved. But game shows have never seen cheating quite as famous, or possibly obvious, as this one. Why don't you try your hand at the $1 million question? A number one followed by 100 zeros is known by what name? Is it A? Google, B, Megatron, C, Gigabit, or D, Nanomole. If you answered Nanomole, I appreciate you trolling the question. 
It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Because nowadays, this is an easy question. I mean, hell, if you saw Back to the Future 3 in the 90s, it was an easy question. For many, that million dollars would have been in the bag. However, for Charles, just like many questions before it, he stumbled. I probably would have stumbled even more, but you know, he struggled. However, there was one last minute plan in place to cheat the way to a million dollars. Before Charles, there had only ever been two people that had won the top prize. Regarding this, a former floor manager named Phil said, Even the cleverest people could only get small wins. It only takes one thing you don't know about and you're done. It's very unusual to actually win a big prize. By the first night, our buddy Charles had established clearly that his win was definitely unusual. He wouldn't admit it after, but even the host was looking a bit dubious. Why did you think it was Switzerland? I'm sure it had made in Switzerland or something written on it. <laughs> Swiss made. <laughs> Following the first night on the show, it was clear his general knowledge was abysmal, just as mine would have been. I really haven't got a Scoobies. Never heard of it. And by the end of the first night on the show, he'd already used two out of his three lifelines. That night, his wife and his friend Tekwen developed a plan. It was simple. Tekwen was going to answer the questions for him. But how? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, Boo. Tekwen was going to cough on the right answer. When a question was asked, Charles would futz around with his answer, waiting for the coded cough from Tekwen pointing to the correct answer. I'm sure it's a hat. Am I sure? <laughs> <coughs> and by the end of the show, it seemed to have worked. It seemed they got away with it. Charles was crowned a millionaire, but he and his wife's glory was short-lived. Because even during the show, behind the scenes, alarm bells were ringing. The whole time, his wife and Tekwen were being monitored by audio and video equipment, but they didn't necessarily know it. And yeah, when you think about it, during a game show, how many coughs is considered reasonable? Before you consider the person either has a drastic illness or is cheating. And following a thorough investigation, the million dollar check was cancelled and the three were found guilty of conspiring to cheat the show. People were shunned and vilified in the public after this, and honestly, guilty or not, I felt that was sad. After this, the three had to step out of the limelight as they were continually vilified in public, and Tekwon was forced to resign as a major in the army. Honestly, I want to tell you about this one, but it happened back in the early 2000s, and I think everyone involved has suffered enough at this point. The three have suffered a lot, and at this point, have lived very humble lives out of the limelight, and honestly, I don't want to pry. Make of this what you will, but at least we can learn a valuable lesson from this. Don't cheat in game shows. Obviously. Number 8. The Psychic, James Heydrich. Have you ever seen people who claim to be psychic? Yeah, me too. One of the most famous psychics who had many people fooled was James Heydrich. He claimed to use psychokinesis to turn the pages of books with his mind and turn around pencils on desks. He went on to TV shows spreading his fraudulent claims. On That's Incredible, he had the host completely fooled, and he was able to fool some viewers into thinking telekinesis was real. However, on That's My Line, he had a special surprise guest. One of my personal heroes, James Randi. Randi was a brilliant magician who actually beat Houdini's record for his amount of time underwater. And in his retirement years, he actually put out a reward for hundreds of thousands of dollars for anyone who could prove that they were psychic under more scientific circumstances. In this case, he had put foam pellets around the page Hydric was going to move. That way, if Hydric was blowing on the page to move it, everyone could clearly see this. And then, did magic happen? Well, look for yourself. After 45 minutes, Hydric still couldn't move the page. Because if he was blowing on the page, it would expose him as a fraud. And for 7 lucky 7, Miss Clear. Call me now. You have questions, I have answers. The first three minutes free. Call now and try it for free. She was a clairvoyant that claimed to have all the answers. She promised to read your future with a toll-free tarot card reading. Spoiler alert, it's a scam. <laughs>
Yes, I know they read the title. I was trying to be facetious. As we already know, the 90s were full of these scams. Call for this, call for that, 1900 horse twaddle. And in 1997, Miss Cleo was one of the biggest of these services. She was an expert in cold reading people. On top of this, she had a very warm and charismatic presence. People easily connected with her, and oftentimes she was very convincing. She often managed to pick up details cold reading people that you wouldn't think she could. So much so that a more gullible 90s audience was just taken by storm. She even showed up on daily talk shows and became a household name in clairvoyancy. Ugh. Pardon my eye rolling. However, believe it or not, there was something about a 1900 clairvoyancy hotline that seemed a little off. Well, duh. You see, this scam was somehow buried in another scam, perhaps a Double scammy? Ha <laughs> ha! Hmm? Oh yeah, they claimed it was toll free as well. I guess that makes this a triple scammy. You see, following her unexpected rise to fame, an opportunity was presented to Cleo by two rich white businessmen. They wanted to take advantage of Miss Cleo's charisma, and a very, very successful 1990s call center was established. The call center was occupied by many quote-unquote psychics. Yeah, these people were just as psychic as Miss Cleo herself. Apparently people wanted original psychic readings, and they were using scripted readings in this call center. Because they wanted me to say, call me now. And I would say, but they're not calling me. They're calling all of these other people. Anyway, I don't think Cleo or the minimum wage psychics were the problem here. I think the real problem was a business that preyed on people's emotions when they were vulnerable. Eventually, the US government reported their issues with this business to the FTC, and they really brought the hammer down. They launched an investigation into the company and shut down the establishment. Federal agents stormed in and took all their computers and equipment. Miss Cleo's psychic call center was no more. In retrospect, if calls to Miss Cleo were supposed to be toll free, how did the company make one billion dollars from just three years of TV commercials? Unsurprisingly, the calls weren't actually free, and Miss Cleo wasn't actually a mystical shaman from Jamaica. Miss Cleo appeared to have a Jamaican accent, and it may have fooled me, but it didn't seem to fool many people of actual Jamaican culture. It was clear that she was appropriating the accent and that it was not an authentic Jamaican accent. It turns out Miss Cleo was actually an aspiring actress from Los Angeles. California. Sadly, Miss Cleo died at the very young age of 53 due to cancer, and she was shunned by the public and not paid well by these men that twisted her identity. The whole thing's tragic, but respects to her for coming out of isolation to fight for LGBTQ plus rights. Miss Cleo realized later that she was lesbian herself. But I really wanted to find a silver lining in all this, something we could take away. And this ex-phone psychic statement really stood out to me. I think it's a good reflection of how to be a decent person. Most of the people who called didn't care if I was psychic. They really just wanted someone to talk to. Number six. Sketches shape up shoes. Well, with a name like Sketches, what were we really expecting? For these shoes to not be sketchy? It's literally in the name. So if you don't mind, I'm just gonna call them Sketchies. Advertising for Sketchy shoes was everywhere. Even Kim Kardashian was making some bold claims about these shoes. She said, What? You never get sick. All right, I'll do it. I am dumping my personal trainer for these butt toning shoes. Yeah. It's not someone else, it's something else. You don't need a personal trainer anymore because you got shoes? Sketchy's commercials were making some mighty bold claims about these $100 shoes. They even said you didn't need to set foot in a gym for these sneakers to help you lose weight. With Shape Ups, you can finally get in shape without going to the gym. They also claimed these sketchy shoes would increase muscle activation by 85%. Apparently, they'd somehow magically cause weight loss, improve circulation, and aerobic conditioning. Hmm, you got any empirical evidence to support these claims? No! 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 Yeah, I didn't think so. Like, how did they think people would buy this? 
As someone who uses the same crappy shoes for his 25 to 42 kilometer mountain jogs, I can say with certainty how often I run up that exhaustingly tall mountain has a lot more to do with my aerobic fitness than what sneakers I use. Good sneakers are important, they just won't help your aerobic fitness. Anyway, needless to say, the Federal Trade Commission was not happy, Jan. Given there was zero scientific evidence, they considered this deceptive advertising. Anyway, FTC stepped in and fined Sketchies $40 million for their bogus, misleading advertising. And honestly, it's nice to hear that sometimes advertising is held accountable. At least there's a watchdog that looks out for consumers in television. I think David from the FTC made a strong point on this case. Either shape up your substantiation or tone down your claims. And reluctantly, number five, Kevin Trudea you. I know I could learn how to pronounce his name, but I just don't wanna. Please excuse me in advance. This one was difficult for me to keep calm on. Dubbed the king of infomercial scams, selling hope to desperate people through disinformation. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna refer to him as the guy. This guy first rose to prominence for infomercials promoting his book. The title, Natural Cures, quote unquote, they don't want you to know. Okay, question I've always wanted to ask these nut jobs. Who is they? Who? Scientists? Doctors? Medical professionals? Are they they? The people who work 12-hour night shifts to try and save our lives in hospitals and research centers? Parliament? Are they talking about Parliament? Do they think Parliament likes pouring billions of dollars into healthcare to stop people dying when there's apparently a natural cheaper cure? <sighs> Sorry, I said I'd keep it brief. Moving on. Fortunately, the Consumer Protection Board was quick to tell people that the book contained no actual cures. It didn't even contain unsubstantiated bullcrap cures. Instead, it only contained instructions on how to subscribe to a 499 lifetime membership service to learn the cures. Despite the warnings, the book still sold over 5 million copies. In fact, it sold so well, he was soon on television again, spruiking his new book. Debt cures, what they really don't want you to know. Oh, just, it's not even an original title. Objective, objective. The first quote unquote cures were garbage, non-science based claims. What were we really expecting? Including that the sun does not cause cancer and sunscreen somehow causes cancer. Why, why would we do that? And he thought AIDS was a hoax and felt he should put this in a book. I'm sure that's not a grotesque insult to mourning families of HIV positive victims at all. How much have you spent? Maybe $10,000, maybe $20,000. Oh, honey, no. He also promoted a bunch of somehow even more sketchy products in a bunch of TV infomercials. His infomercials included hair farming, cures for balding non-surgery facelifts, a 60 second cure to all addictions, all the humanity, coral calcium supplements as a cure for cancer. No, 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 I'm done. Unsurprisingly, in 2008, a federal court ruled that there are consequences for going on TV and selling a fake cure for cancer. Thank goodness. And the guy was ordered to repay all $37 million of profit from the sham coral calcium supplement. He failed to pay a cent and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. But the most depressing part to me was the comment section of this news article about him being jailed. It was all filled with creepy comments claiming the government hunted him and he needs to be freed and Oh, the government didn't hunt him, the FTC did. And the FTC didn't even hunt him, they just asked him to repay the $37 million of profiteering from victims of cancer. Is that really that unreasonable? And he didn't shell out a dime for those cancer victims. Depressing comments aside, I think it was a small minority of people that bought into these scams, but you know, people deserve better than that. Oh, I like this one better. Number four. The shake weight. Oh, I think we need something light and silly after that last one. Just the fact that a boardroom full of adults thought this was a good idea for a product makes me chuckle. No one claimed anything terrible. No one claimed it was gonna cure you of a nasty disease. The shake weight was just a dumb workout idea. Apparently, the shake weight had dual moving weights called dynamic inertia. What's a stupid name? These dynamic inertia supposedly engaged your biceps and triceps. In fact, the commercial boldly claims that you will feel the results of the shake weight 
within nine seconds. If you had the shake weight in your hands right now, you'd feel the results before the end of this commercial. Ma'am, who are you kidding? How did you say that to the camera with a straight face? In the comments to this commercial, probably my favorite comment was from Miss Mooks Bubble. I once saw a shake weight at my gym and I picked it up out of curiosity. I even shook it a couple of times to try and get a feel for it. Some dude I had never seen before walked by me and simply said, I saw that. No judgment, man. Looking at it, it is tempting. Oh, and now number three, the Max Headroom incident. I've heard some people call this the most disturbing hijacking in the history of American television. And seeing it, yeah, I get where they're coming from. Imagine it's 1987, you're in a dark room late at night, and you're watching a Doctor Who episode. Then suddenly, the television goes black. Moments later, a person with a strange mask appears on your screen. The strange background is moving wildly. The guy's mask is based on Max Headroom, the first computer-generated TV presenter. And what does this disturbing figure do or say? Well, he calls Doctor Who a nerd. And uh, he sings a theme to Clutch Cargo. but his voice is kind of distorted. I guess that's kind of scary. This one's a bit of a weasel call and wording as it's not much of a scam per se. Sure, the guy's technically lying on television, but he's mostly just talking nonsense. But it's just too interesting for me to not tell you about. Apparently, Chicago's television stations had been completely hijacked, resulting in this broadcast spreading all across Chicago televisions. The background of corrugated metal is apparently meant to resemble the original Max Headroom's background Background. It gets even weirder as the pirate broadcast goes on. By the 42nd mark, he's being uh, whipped on the butt with a fly swatter. Honestly, it's all pretty senseless and weird, and not that scary, just kind of funny. Though it really shook some people up back in the day. Nowadays, this TV hijacking is a cultural phenomenon, with a surprising amount of Max Headroom incident merchandise. In the comments, I think Times New Logan summarized the responses very well. Adults reacted by saying this was horrifying, vile, and inappropriate, but the little kids thought it was hilarious. Perhaps the biggest question to the internet nowadays is just who did this? Has a now 60 to 70 year old boomer prankster ever been caught? Well, there's been plenty of speculation over the years. According to Wikipedia, Max, his buddy, and his whipping lady likely had two origins. Firstly, the whole thing could have been an inside job by disgruntled employees. Or it could have been Chicago's underground hacking community. Despite decades passing and an intense FCC investigation, the culprit was never found. But who knows, if an FBI agent gets bored sometime, maybe he can try and track down this now elderly trickster. It's cool to see nowadays that the Max Headroom hack has become a cyberpunk hacking trope. It's influenced Jack Nicholson's Joker, or even the plot in V for Vendetta. So thank you to that weird hacker boomer in a stupid mask. You've really inspired some cool creative tropes. Oh, this one's a story. The Fire Festival. If it sounds too good to be true, it's probably false. The giant blue anthropomorphic hedgehog wasn't wrong. And few things demonstrate us this point further than the fraudulent event that was Fire Festival. It was promoted on a massive scale on social media like Instagram. Fire Festival promised luxury camping sites, world famous celebrities, and pristine facilities. This ad was broadcast all over social media. It showed supermodels on the beach in luxury yachts, seeming to look as superficial as possible. For a while, we just couldn't escape this Fire Festival. Festival advertising. The problem was, these commercials were Firefest for 60 people. It was luxury events and supermodels. And they promised in this commercial, everyone would get to experience this. But this commercial was one hell of a lie. How'd this all start? Well, a fellow named Billy had deceived his investors obtaining $27 million to fund the event. The event was promising a luxury party in the Bahamas. And the Bahamas is known worldwide for its beautiful luxury vacation islands. Unfortunately, the Bahaman government had not actually given Billy permission to use any Bahaman island for his fire festival. 
and certainly not when he was using his ad to advertise drug lords of the Bahamas. Despite this, Billy continued to promote the event as if it was being hosted on a private island. He even made fake maps to give to attending patrons. The unfortunate reality was, the event was actually being held at a parking lot development site in Roker Point, Great Exuma, and it certainly wasn't as pretty as the commercials might have you believe. The final band lineup had 33 artists, including Blink-182 and Pusha T, but every single band pulled out. Oh dear. Rich customers were told to load up for this cashless event in advance. They were told to put thousands of dollars into their Radio Firebrand digital bracelet. Despite Billy being told the Wi-Fi sucked and that the bracelets wouldn't work at the parking lot. Billy was actually swindling customers so he could pay off his loans. But Billy and his fraudster ways would only get him so far before the chickens would come back to roost. And Billy had six weeks before guests with astronomically high expectations would arrive at the Bahamas. Understandably, these people would be angry and demand answers. And I want answers too. Get him, Karen. I demand to speak to the manager. He's mine. I'll take him on. The morning of guest's arrival, heavy rain fell on the event site. This soaked the open tents and mattresses piled out in the open for guests later that day. Oh no, now they can't even stay dry. And so the dreaded day of reckoning finally came. And how was a customer's experience? Well, what do you think? At first, Blink-182 arrived and announced to fans that they'd be leaving the festival. They stated in a Twitter post, We're not confident that we would have what we need to give you the quality of performances we always give our fans. Yeah, I think that's a bit of an understatement, guys. Anyway, shortly after, a stampede of 500 upset, drunk customers showed up to an unfinished campsite. Poorly made crisis tents with dirt floors, wet floor mattresses, no infrastructure or running water. And the great gourmet food was cheese sandwiches served in foam containers. In other words, Fire Festival was a crap hole. And since it was a cashless event, many patrons arrived without money or a taxi fare. The whole thing was a party you'd be very, very glad you stayed home for. Anyway, wrapping up, Billy had millions of dollars unpaid and millions of dollars of debt. Customers got home upset and traumatized, and Billy was sticking his head in the sand. He bailed like a coward and was sued for millions of dollars. He eventually was arrested but was put out on bail, but he immediately went on to fraud hundreds of thousands of dollars out of customers in a new Ponzi scheme. This time, he couldn't dodge jail and served six years in federal prison. I bet the guests of the parking lot who were down hundreds of thousands of dollars will be not too sad to hear that. And my consolations to anyone who attended this event. I hope your next event will be a hell of a lot better. If it sounds too good to be true, it's probably false. And not so lucky last, number one, the lottery advertising. I know what you're thinking, but Josh, lottery isn't a scam. I assure you, there is no bigger scam than this. Sadly, as of 2021, US adults spend an average of $370 per person annually on lottery tickets. And as you might have guessed, that's not equal spending, as big spenders push up the average, but we'll get to that later. You've probably seen lottery ads before saying, it could be you, or wouldn't it be nice? Or maybe just imagine if you won. Wouldn't it be nice to share with 30 million? You won. <laughs> because if you can imagine it, it can seem real in your head. But it is mathematically impossible for you to win the lottery. You see, the chances of you winning your average lottery, such as Powerball, are 1 in 292,338,138. Now you might say, well, someone's got to win. It might be me. But let me put that in perspective for you. You have a 1 in 1.2 million chance of being struck by lightning per year, or a 1 in 35,000 chance of dying in a cataclysmic storm. But the chance of either of these happening to you are tiny, minuscule, you wouldn't even consider them. But when you take that number, you are 8,348 more times more likely to die in a storm than win the lottery, and 243 times more likely to be struck by lightning. And both of those are almost impossibly unlikely to happen to you. That makes the chances of winning the lottery so 
astronomically tiny and insignificant. It could technically be claimed it's lying to say it's even possible for you to win the lottery. And your odds of winning don't increase by playing frequently. The chance remains 1 in 292,201,338. There is a very significant possibility that of all the 231 million people who have viewed my videos, even for a second over the last 10 years, absolutely none have ever won the lottery. Let's take the largest stadium in the world, say the stadium in North Korea, and that stadium was filled to capacity and every single person had a lottery ticket. Your chances of winning that lottery in that stadium would be huge by comparison to regular lottery. Your odds of winning would be 1 in 150,000. But you'd probably look at that stadium of 150,000 people and say, there's no chance I could win. Why bother? You would need 1,947 more stadiums all filled to capacity with one winner between them all to even have the same chances of the lottery. Every lottery ad you have ever seen is lying to you. The lottery is the ultimate scam because it's a socially accepted scam. People can spend their money how they want, but I would implore them to spend their money on something real. Put that money in a bank, give it to a homeless person, help buy an ice cream, anything but the lottery. And with $370 average spent by all Americans per year on the lottery, Obviously, that doesn't mean everyone is spending money on the lottery. It's worse because a small amount of heavy players are spending way more money than that per year on the lottery. And the lottery preys on desperation. Because Harvard Kennedy School studies have found that the most of the lottery players are on low income. The people who play the lottery are often the people who need that money desperately. Lottery instills false hope on people and preys on the poor. Some consider the lottery a disguised tax on those who can least afford it, and you can probably see why. Fun fact, if those spenders put that $5 per week into a retirement account instead, the minimum they would end up with is $25,000 extra in retirement. And that is a lot more fun than 40 years of disappointment. Because in the end, the only winning tactic to win the lottery is to not play the lottery. And thanks for joining me on this slightly different from the usual journey. I realize I skipped over certain categories for this, but it was a bit of a fine line to both discuss scams and also keep this fun. Hopefully this was interesting, or at least informative. Let me know if you have any comments below. And this is a new type of content for me, so if you did enjoy the video, a like is always appreciated. And as always, thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll see you next time. What? Today we had some really good member questions, but eventually I went with your local Chaos's question. We'll get to some more next time. They ask, have you ever believed or almost believed in any scam? Oh sure, I definitely bought lottery tickets as soon as I was old enough to. I spent a lot of my early life poor, and desperation for money definitely makes some of these scams seem more real. I never spent too much on lottery and I never gave personal information, but I've seen some of my dad's friends lose thousands of dollars on email scams. So keep an eye on some of your less internet savvy family members as they can be prime targets for some of these scams.